today we're going to continue our series in the book of Mark where Jesus uh, shares two parables with the people that are gathered to him, uh, near to him, concerning the kingdom of God. And these parables uh, teach some indirect lessons on how the seed of truth of the word of God continues or how it starts to grow and continues to grow with, within the individual in the human heart and also collectively within his church. So if you have Bibles with you, um, if you would turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 4, we'll be reading from verses 26 to 34, and we'll have it up on the overhead here as well. Mark, chapter 4, 26 to 34, and we're going to be talking about the parables of the growing seeds. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scattered seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his disciples, his own disciples, he explained everything. So we look at these two parables this morning, parables of growing seeds. And these parables um, that Jesus told the crowds here were, um, I guess he had left off with the parable of the sower earlier on in the chapter. If you remember the parable of the sower, that we spoke about a number of weeks ago um, in the beginning of Mark 4. Jesus taught concerning the condition of people's hearts when it comes to hearing God's truth. So the word of God is sown onto the hearts of humanity. The sower sows the word onto the hearts. And um, some hearts were hard, it says in the parable of the sower. And the word did not penetrate them. The seed of the word didn't penetrate them. And the powers of darkness swooped down like birds, picking the seed off the person's heart. And some had other kinds of soil in their heart. There was some hardness under the surface. It, there was a bit of softness on the surface, but it was still hard underneath. And it didn't provide a depth of good soil for the roots to grow in. And when hard times came, that person's uh, life shriveled up and, uh, and died. And then there was the person whose heart was good, but they also had seeds of worldliness mingled with the seeds of truth in their heart. And the cares of this world choked out the growth of the truth from God's word, and they were very unhealthy. And then there was a person whose heart was fertile and ready to receive the truth. The seed sprouted in that heart, and it brought new life. Today, Jesus, teaching from the parables here in Mark chapter 4, 26 to 34, they take their cue from the perspective of spiritual growth, which occurs in the heart that is fertile and is readily accepting the word of God. So let's talk about the seed planted in the fertile heart. When Jesus came to the world, he came to testify to the truth. Jesus said, actually, in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And when Jesus was standing on trial before his crucifixion, before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, and Pilate was trying to determine who Jesus was and if he was a threat to Rome, the governor asked Jesus, if he was a king. And Jesus told Pilate that in fact he was a king, but that his kingdom 
was not of the world, but was a spiritual kingdom. In John 18, 37, uh, we read Pilate's response, and he said, You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate didn't get what Jesus was actually referring to and saying in, in the deep way that he was saying it. But today when we reflect on this, what the Lord was saying is that whoever listens to him, being the living word of God, hears the truth. And he who obeys the truth, life shall come to that person. Hearing the truth of the gospel or the good news concerning the person and work of Jesus and believing the message that the gospel presents is the start of the kingdom of God that is referred to with the growing plants in this parable, in these parables. God's seed of truth is planted in the fertile heart. The planting of truth within a person, it can come directly from a person reading the written word of God. Maybe you uh, were converted simply by someone handing a Bible to you and you began to read the word of God and something happened inside. Um, for the first century people, listening to the truth spoken directly by Jesus, um, they heard the word of God directly from his mouth, Jesus being the living word of God. Or the planting of truth can come from an ambassador commissioned by Jesus who sows the word into the heart as an ambassador. And this is why believers all the way through the centuries, we're called Christ's ambassadors. We're called to share the good news of God's truth with others so that the seed is scattered upon their hearts. It's always been this way from the start. The good news about Jesus is the truth. And Jesus spoke the word of truth and the apostles listened. The apostles spoke the word of truth to others and they in turn continued spreading the word, the good word of truth throughout the world. And the gospel has been given all the way through the generations since Jesus walked on the earth to where we are right now. And somewhere along the line, you listen to the truth if you believe in Jesus. If you've been saved, you listen to the truth. And we're called to continue in this tradition of truth sowing into the hearts of others that they may hear it and as well come to believe. In Ephesians chapter 1, 11 to 14, um, the apostle Paul, he proclaims this. He says, in him we were also chosen, having predestined been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will. In order that we, who are the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth. The gospel of your salvation. When you believe, you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. What a powerful scripture. You see, once the truth of God's word had been planted in the soil of a fertile heart, a receptive heart, a great miracle takes place. Man has done what he can do. Plant the seed. Unless that person, of course, is going directly into the word of God. And God has done what only he can do. Grow the seed. To the praise of his glory, our God has planned from the beginning that his truth would be a catalyst for spiritual life. The seed of truth germinates and brings spiritual maturity to individuals, individual hearts. 
The kingdom of God grows within the heart of a person as the result of that truth in them. When the truth is planted inside, this, inside a receptive spirit, when your heart is open to God and the truth is planted in you, just like a seed in a garden, it needs to be watered to start life. It needs the sun to shine on it as well to bring new life to it. So with the water and the sun, the seed miraculously comes to life. The human heart is watered by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is poured onto the human heart, the seed of truth that was given from God's word germinates and it comes to life. And the, the glory of God, the illumination of God in his Holy Spirit shines upon the heart that has been watered that has been planted, and everything combined causes that seed to germinate and to grow and to spring into life and to begin spiritual life. It is a miracle. We don't totally understand how it all happens, but the truth of God's word um, is a miracle. The truth of God's word is a life-giving miracle. We might ex be exposed to Bible teachings, for instance, and, and we hear them. In Romans 10, 17, it's written this. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But the life of faith does not come to life within a person unless it is impacted by the Water and light illumination of the Holy Spirit. It's written in John 15, 26. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from, all the, uh, from, the, out from the Father, he will testify about me. So the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that was sent by the Father into the world once Jesus ascended and sat at the Father's right hand, he um, illuminates and waters the seed of the word that is planted within a person. And it springs to life. And without the spirit bringing it alive, um, it's not, it's, it's not going to germinate. It's not going to bring life. Once the seed is planted, the sower trusts the Lord to the miracle of germination. Once a person hears the truth and believes it, from that point on, they start a journey as a child of God. The person who the Bible says is born again in the Spirit. Jesus said to Nicodemus, the Pharisee, in John 3.3, 3, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And that truth begins to grow as a spiritual life within the heart, within the heart that receives the Holy Spirit. And this is a mystery of the kingdom of God that Jesus explained in this parable. How does the truth spring to life inside of a human heart? The interaction between truth and God's word and the Holy Spirit, it's a great mystery, but it's written in Mark 4, 27, 28. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows Though he does not know how, all by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. You want to see spiritual maturity? Yield yourself to God and the Holy Spirit. And allow his word to, to go deep inside of you. And you will find that the word of God will come to life. You know, many people have said, I don't necessarily understand how... I can read the Bible as I did before I became a true Christian. And it's so different now that I'm a Christian than it was before. Um, before a person comes to know salvation, God was distant. He was far away. We were separated from him by our sins. And sometimes when a person before they're a Christian, reads, when they read the Bible... It just seems like words on a page. And sometimes it, it, it might be dry. Sometimes it seems 
confusing when it's read just like any other book. But when a heart pursues God and says, Lord, teach me what your word is saying, I, I want to know. I want to know you, Lord. When that prayer is prayed by a person that's reading the word before they're a believer, the Holy Spirit comes down into that person's conscience and talks to them and says, this is what I'm saying. And he calls them to himself. You and I have experienced this if we've come to be born again in Christ. And then when our hearts are yielded to the Spirit, the Spirit pours his power in like water and illumination, like sunlight, onto the seed of that word, and it brings life. It comes to life, and all of a sudden, hey, I get it. I understand what you're saying, God. I understand. God, in God's forgiveness and restoration, we become alive in the Spirit, and the seed um, supernaturally springs into life. For me, when the Holy Spirit made, makes God's truth alive in my heart, I don't know about for you, maybe you're different, but for me, I, the tangible changes, I, I've seen it at periods of time in my life where I've just gone to the Lord's Word, and I've just had this brokenness about me, and I'm like, God, I need your help. I need you, Lord, to show me the way. And you do that, Right? And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit reveals his power through his word, and it comes to life. And all of a sudden, something just goes click. And you're like, that's what you mean, Lord. Thank you for that illumination, God. Thank you for that life. And it brings life to you. And it changes your perspective. And you, you go out, and the, the grass is greener. The sun shines brighter. Our step seems lighter. And our spirit feels clean. You know, out there in the world before we know Christ, I, I don't think people understand how dirty their spirit is. When you come to a cleansing by the power of the living God and the Holy Spirit is poured out upon you, there is a cleansing stream that flows upon you and cleans you out. And it is good. It is so good to surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit. You know that song, It is well with my soul, right? My sin, not in part, but the whole, has been nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. It is well with my soul. It is well. It's a beautiful, shining thing that takes place inside of us. And sets us free. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is what it's referring to. When the Holy Spirit brings the word to life, cleanliness in the spirit is the result. He purges everything and just makes you feel like a child. You know, some people have done so much in their lives, they wonder... Is it ever possible to feel innocent again? My life is just so filled with crud. Oh, you know what? There's innocence in Jesus. <laughs> There's innocence. The filthiest stream can be made pure. The filthiest heart can be washed clean by the precious blood of Jesus. And the power of the Spirit brings life. Coming to faith in Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit, it changes everything. It brings real abundance in life. I have given you life and life abundantly, life to the full. It changes everything in the fabric of our existence. A, a fully surrendered life to the Lord can be outwardly observed, you know? This is what God wants us to be. He wants us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and to shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life because the people around us are watching. And when they see the transformative power of the Holy Spirit at work in God's people because the word of God has come alive inside of them, there is a new thing that happens. They look at us and they say, what have you got that I don't have? I need what you have. Can you tell me what you have? They might not say it out, outrightly. Sometimes they do. 
But inwardly, they're looking at what Jesus is doing in your life, and they're going, I want that. Whatever it is that you've tapped into. Oh God, help us. Help us to come to you, Lord, and bear our spirit to you and say, take it all, Lord. Keep our, our love for you hot. Let us not be lukewarm, forgetting our first love. Help us, Lord, to shine like stars in the universe. And then when we share your word, people will ask, what is it you have that I don't have? Wow. So the first parable spoken by Jesus concerning the kingdom of God in Mark 4, 26 to 29, it speaks of truth being planted and germinated in a human's heart individually. Now, I think the second parable, the second half of the scripture that we read, it talks about a, a plant called a mustard plant. And I, I have done some thinking about this and reading about it, and, and it seems as though this is a corporate, it, it can be applied corporately to corporate growth. Verses 30 to 32 of our text speaks prophetically, I believe, about how God will grow his corporate church. The seed of truth germinates and brings spiritual life to his church. So the truth of God coming into the world is planted in the soil of the world, and the church is exemplified, in this case, as a mustard plant. There's many analogies that the church is referred to. We we see the church referred to in Scripture as the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ. We've been referred to as an army, the army of God. Um, but in Mark 4, 30 to 32, there is this plant that starts from a tiny little seed. Mustard seed, very small seed. I was in Israel, I think I've mentioned this in a sermon a long time ago. And uh, we were walking in the, uh, the ruins where uh, Dan, the tribe of Dan, settled in this place called Tal Dan. And there was these big plants, these huge plants, big woody stalks. And the tour guide says, that's a mustard, mustard plant. So I went, I'm curious, right? Go over and look on the branches. And there's these, these tiny little pod things. And, and, you, and inside are these tiny little brown seeds, tiny Tiny little brown, huge plant, tiny seeds. The kingdom of God is like this little mustard seed. That, that's a mustard seed of truth that's planted into the garden of the world. Now, the Jews understood this because they grew mustard. And mustard started from the smallest of seeds. I, I'm sure there's probably seeds in the world that are smaller than mustard seeds. But in the garden in, in Israel... These little mustard seeds were the tiniest seeds, but yet they grew the biggest plants. They would have understood this, and um, I think it's good for us to pay attention to this as well. Um, like a mustard seed, the kingdom of God starts, started off very small. Jesus um, planted the original seed of truth in the soil of the world when he came, and uh, his 12 disciples uh, they, they came from very small beginnings. Um, they were a persecuted minority. But from small beginnings, the Holy Spirit breathed life into his church. And the seed germinated. And the seed started to grow and has grown in the soil, garden soil of the world. And it's become very large. From Jesus and the original 12 disciples, we see it went to hundreds of people. Then to thousands and ultimately there are millions of believers that have been in, come into the kingdom of God since Jesus walked on the earth. And Jesus was saying to this parable that the truth that he was sowing to the observing eye might be perceived as very small and insignificant. Jesus, born in a stable in the little town of Bethlehem, raised in the little obscure town of Nazareth, you know, it didn't seem like this pompous entry of the kingdom of God into the world. The Lord stooped out of heaven and veiled himself in flesh, and he came into the most humble of circumstances, just like a little mustard seed, just a tiny seed. 
but his life in the earth has impacted the world in an incredible way. This seemingly small start would one day grow into the very largest plant in the garden of the world. And uh, it shoots out many branches. Mustard plant, when you look at the mustard plant, it's kind of like, um, it's not like a spruce tree, you know, where you have the boughs that kind of hang down. It's got these branches that kind of stick out everywhere. And they're, it's just like this great big bush almost. Well, there is uh, another side to this parable. Jesus said that the kingdom of God would be, I guess, so monstrously large that even the birds would perch on some of its branches for shade. And I, I was looking at it, what is the, what is the meaning of this? The birds uh, come and rest on the branches. Hmm. Maybe it means that the world, you know, finds shelter in the branches of Christianity. But then when you look at the parable of the sower, um, the birds represent actually evil that comes to roost or that comes down and picks off the seed and gobbles up the seed so that it doesn't, doesn't multiply, so it doesn't germinate into the soil. So I, I think actually that Jesus giving this example, um, birds in the scripture uh, like this represent, it can represent evil emissaries of Satan who swoop down to, sp to pick off the seeds of truth. Um, holding to the context of the bird in the first part of Mark 4, 30 to 30, uh, Mark chapter 4, sorry, with the parable of the sower. When we go to verses 30 to 32, one might interpret the meaning of the birds that are roosting in the shade um, is that they're resting on some of the branches of the church which harbor some evil. Commentator Warren Wearsby says this, he says, the growth of the kingdom will not result in the conversion of the world. In fact, even though it's large, um, some of the growth will give an opportunity for Satan to get in and go to work. Satan's emissaries who are found roosting in the branches of the church are eager to, eager to gobble up any good seed of truth that they find. So you see the church, and I think if you look at history, you see this, right? David Guzik Another commentator puts it this way. Jesus, in considering the growth of the work of God, reminds us that the size and status are not necessarily always benefits. Corrupt Christianity has been a curse in the world, being a form of godliness without power. So what Jesus was suggesting, talking about these birds, possibly, is that God's kingdom from humble beginnings would grow very large and would have very, very many branches. But there were... Um, there are problems on some of the branches that have come off of the, the tree, I guess, of Christendom. So, but at any rate, okay, it's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult analogy, and there's two different thoughts on this. Okay? One is that the birds represent people in the world that find shelter, but if you look at the birds in context with everything else that's been said, in Mark chapter 4 with the parable of the sower, it could be that it's talking, Jesus is prophetically talking about the church having some issues, that uh, it would grow up, but there would be some issues. Um, the seed of truth, however, was, was planted in the human heart and in the form of the church. Why? Why did God plant this seed? John 15, 8, I believe, answers it. Jesus state, states this. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Now, the bright light that emanates from the believer walking closely with the Lord is recognizable. And I believe that God wants his church and the individuals who make up his church to bear his signature. The life that comes into the world through the church and the life that comes into the human heart by the power of the Holy Spirit is God's signature. And the characteristics of God's signature 
are meant to bear the fruit of righteousness. This luminosity that we have in the Spirit as a result of the product of God's Spirit growing the truth in us, bringing the truth to life in us. This luminosity, I, it, we can also see this is actually the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what God desires to become the harvest of righteousness from the planting of truth. We know that we're growing in the Spirit when the fruit of the Spirit is eminent through us and in us. In Galatians 5, and 23, we're told, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And the fruit of the Spirit, I believe, when we talk about when the non-Christian looks at our lives and sees us and says, I want what it is that you have, what they're actually wanting and what they're actually seeing is the, the fruit of the Spirit being manifest through us. And, you know, you are the light of the world, right? This is another analogy. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. We, if we cover it up, if we put a bushel or a covering over our lives, the darkness of the world doesn't see the light of Jesus. Okay? We were meant to bear good fruit, to shine the light of the fruit of righteousness into the four corners of the world. Your world is here in 100 mile. My world is here in 100 mile. God has purposed that we shine the light, that we bear good fruit so that they will know our, that we are disciples so that, that, that they will know that we have the truth that sets people free. This is how the gospel uh, is, is, is powerful in our midst, is when the fruit of the Spirit hangs from the boughs of our lives. What we described here in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, I think it's good for us to do a fruit check. <laughs> it really is good for us. Lord, when I read that description of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, how's it going? <laughs> is, there, is there fruit on the boughs of my life? What is my default nature? You know, like some people actually have got the wrong idea about Christians sometimes because they look at the Christian who looks like he's been sucking on a lemon for five months He's the grumpiest old guy that you've ever met. He yells at his dog, he yells at his wife, and he yells at the world. And the world looks at that. And that's, that's the fruit of their spirit. I don't want anything to do with it. Get away. I'm not saying that that's the case all the time. But if we did the fruit check, right? And God put his finger on something and said, hey, man, there's something not right here. Okay, Lord, where do you want me? What do you want me to surrender? What do you want me to, to give to you that I haven't been giving to you? Because if I am a bitter old lemon or persimmon, okay, out there, and that's my persona that I'm putting out to the world, there is something wrong because the fruit of the Holy Spirit is this in Galatians chapter 5. I'm not here to judge you. I think this is something that we need to ask the Lord to reveal to us. And out there, they're going to know what it is that drives us. If we're driven by things other than the fruit of the Spirit, it's going to be a bitter gall out there that's going to turn them off. And I'm not saying that just because you display the the fruit of the Spirit, that everybody's going to be attracted to you. No, that's, not, that's tr not true. Because if you display the fruit of the Spirit, sometimes people will be pushed away from you because you bring light in, into their circumstance and they are wanting to stay in the darkness so that their deeds can, can remain hidden. 
They don't want to be eliminated, so they want to stay as far away from you as they can stay. Now, there's also that effect of the, of the light and the fruit of the Spirit. If someone wants to remain in the darkness, you are going to cause an offense to them, and they're going to push away from you. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Children called after his name. In the early church, Jesus Christ was alive in his people, and, they, and the church exploded in growth. We've seen revivals over, the, over, over time where growth has just exploded, and revival always comes when God's people humble themselves and pray and seek his face and just say, Lord, clean me out. Help me to be the person that you want me to be. I don't want anything else in this life, God. Take everything except for what you want to do in my life. If God's people earnestly pray that, sincerely pray that, Lord, take it all. Take everything that I am and everything that I have. The fruit of the Spirit will hang from the branches and people will see that and they'll go, take me to your master. Apostle Paul um, puts it this way in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 18. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not certainly precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You see, when we live for eternity and we live with our eyes set on the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, our perspective changes. No longer do we live for ourselves to live in such a way that uh, I'm just benefiting myself at the expense of the others around me. But my life becomes selflessly devoted to the kingdom of God and to the glory of God. And then the people out there see the heart that God has turned towards himself. And they see the fruit of the spirit. You see, notice this, the fruit. You can't make the fruit of the spirit grow on you. It's the fruit of the spirit. It doesn't come as a matter of human effort. It comes as a matter of human humility. Not human effort. Human um, bowing down. Humans bowing down to the Lord and saying, take me, Lord. I know that I am not able to go this way and to, to be this person that you called me to be. But nevertheless, I give what I have to you. Just as I am, Lord, I give you my life. And the Holy Spirit does his miracle work in watering and illuminating and growing. And that's where the fruit comes. It comes, from a it comes as a matter of yielding to the Lord, giving the Lord the throne of our heart, saying, I don't care about anything else. Are you willing to give up this? Are you willing to give up that for the Lord? If you're not, you're not going to experience the growth of the fruit of the Spirit. You can't pick and choose. You can't say, I'm going to live this way for myself, and I'll live this side for God. You can't do it that way. It doesn't work. God wants all. He wants everything. And when you bow the knee of your heart in everything to him, he causes the fruit to grow. And it's miraculous how it grows. The growing of the Spirit inside of a person, as the scripture here this morning has said, is a miraculous process. And we don't necessarily even understand how it works. But when you s say, Lord, take all of me, the Spirit does his miracle work inside of you and waters that and illuminates that and causes it to grow. And you will bear much fruit. And it is the will of the Lord that you bear much fruit. That's what he said in his word, right? It's my will that you, in, in John 15, 8, this is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, much fruit. Not just a little shriveled up old grape on the far end of the branch. You know, much fruit, heavily laden with the fruit of the Spirit. Heavily laden. That's the Spirit, and that's his work. Amen. 
So today, the fruit check. Lord, is there fruit on my branch? Am I a branch that has the characteristics of your Holy Spirit's working in me? If not, Lord, I, I surrender what it is that I need to to you today. Would you grow inside of me, Lord? Would you grow your fruit of righteousness in me? Amen. And if you're here today and you've never truly given Jesus Christ the lordship of your life, you can make Jesus your Lord by bowing your knee to him. Maybe the Holy Spirit is calling you. Maybe online today, you've never given Jesus the throne of your heart. You've, you've always kept it to yourself. You've tried to work so that you're a good person and that you bear all these good things that, that the fruit uh, represents. But I can tell you, you can't do it on your own. You won't be able to be the person that God has planned for you to be until you surrender lordship of your heart to him, the throne of your heart to him. When you do that, he will make you new and he'll fill you with his Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's presence will bear good fruit. And as Christians, walk in the Spirit. Walk and step with the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh or the desires of the sin nature. The fruit will be bearing on the branches of your life when you keep and step with the Spirit because it is His fruit and His fruit comes in abundance to a yielded heart. Amen.